Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for sticking around for this, I guess, uh, fairly late session. Um, yeah, and as I already mentioned, I would like to talk about a tool I've developed. Um, just a very teeny tiny bit about myself. So I'm a hobby system administrator. I do not get paid for it. I'm just something that I do in my free time. I do self-hosting quite a bit. Big fan of NixOS. Um, and I started to actively use SystemD maybe like two years ago, maybe not even that much on that long ago, where I mean like actively creating SystemD unit files and then starting to work with them and trying out different features from SystemD. And what I've learned is that SystemD is amazing. I love it. It has so many different features. It's like I can go on and on and on and reading this very long documentation and um, continu I'm continuously learning new things about SystemD. Um, so I did play quite a bit with SystemD hardening of different unit files, um, and it makes yeah, a lot of fun. But I do think that the user or developer experience is, well, kind of clunky. It doesn't feel as modern as maybe other tools, or um, yeah, it just feels like a bit dare I say old. So let's just pretend we're going to view this as I have seen it like from, from experience by myself or from a very new user's perspective. We have created this awesome hello world.service file or unit file and what we're going to do is that we're going to use it, start it, and then we're going to debug it because it contains a mistake. And it is kind of a silly example. It doesn't really matter what it's doing. Essentially, we're just starting a Python server that will crash because I've misconfigured something in this unit file. Um, but yeah, apart from that, let's like, it's just an example. OK, so I want you to, like, I want to share the pain. So we're going to go through this very silly, um, well, not silly, but this workflow that I have been using for a long time. Um, and then I'm going to like, highlight the things that uh, I find annoying. OK, so we're going to start with the screencast. So we want to access the server that is, well, should be running on this host. And then I would see, ah, no, it failed. It crashed. Something is wrong. So then I would continue to just run system control status to see the status output. OK, and then I can see, yeah, the service has failed. It has crashed. Something is wrong. Um, and then I would try my luck and see the last few log lines that I can see from system control status. And then I can see, ah, dang, like, I'm still missing the relevant output. It's like too much debug output. And I can just see that it has failed. OK, but I know what I got to do, right? I read the man page. I can just con call journal control. Ah, and this is a very common mistake, maybe not when I'm typing it out, but when I'm actually going through shell history commands that I accidentally call the user um, scope and not the system scope. And this is especially common when you're very frequently switching between the two. OK, maybe that's just me, but it does happen to me quite frequently. So then let's do it correctly. Let's run the command that we actually need to. Um, and then we open up the pager. Then I can like scroll through. I can find the relevant line that I need to see to understand what the underlying issue is. Again, the exact detail is not relevant. But then I know, OK, now I know how to fix it. So now I will use system control edit runtime to actually edit the unit file. And I don't have the permissions to do it. So damn, OK, I need to now redo this command again with sudo. So I will prefix it with sudo to get the correct privileges. Um, and then I will edit the file. But now the next annoyance, because I ran it with sudo, it's configured as the root. So now I'm getting the editor that is configured for the root user, not my personal preference. Um, so it's not my editor. It's not the tool that I'm very familiar with. It's nano, which I have well used maybe once in my life. Um, and now I say, OK, then I'm just going to manually edit it. But you know, it feels like I'm very s slowly working because I have to type things out and can't use editor magic, although it's probably slower with my editor magic than actually just typing it out. Um, but yeah, so we can see we are fixing the underlying issue. Um, and then I will try my luck again in trying to access the underlying service. Um, and then, ah, yeah, I forgot to restart the command or the service. So then I redo the same again. So I'm going to restart the service now. And then again, I don't know if it works or not. Like maybe it worked, maybe it didn't. So I will try my luck in accessing the service again. And now it actually works. Yay, I made it. Um, but you can also imagine that if this didn't work, then I can restart this process from the top. And then, well, I redo the same steps. And it yeah, feels a bit slow, a bit clunky. Um, and to be very explicit, I mean, System control should work this way. Like system control is doing everything correctly. It is like very nice, very separated. Commands are very specific meanings. Um, but when I'm using it as an end user, well, yeah, it does feel a bit clunky. Exactly. So 
Um, then back then, I tried to look for an alternative and kind of get a better workflow going. Um, and back then, I found the C, which is like a very nice tools or terminal user interface for system control. Um, and it is essentially just a shell script that wraps around FCF, which is like this fuzzy finding binary that provides like a minimal tree interface. Um, and essentially, it also includes a preview window for system control strat status and prefixes things with sudo if required. And I'm just going to share like a tiny bit like to show you how it looks like. So if we call the C, then here on the left-hand side, you will see now only the user units that are matching, and then you have this preview window from system control status, which is kind of nice. Then you can search for the unit you're interested in um, with fuzzy matching, and now, well, we have found the unit we're interested in, and then again, you have this preview window, and in this preview window, you can only scroll up and down, but FCF, for example, does not allow to scroll left to right. Um, and then if you press enter, then you see like a list of options, and then you can select one of these pre-configured options. But the one that I would like to use, for example, edit runtime is not available. Um, so you would either have to edit the source code or just, well, don't use it. Um, so just for the sake of comparison here, I'm just going to open up the pager again, and then we can find the relevant line. But now the actual limitation um, of using the C is that if we close the pager, then it stops because the C is just like this one short command and you can do this one thing and then it closes, it's done, it has done its job. But then if you want to do the next thing, then you would either run the command again separately or call the C again. Um, and so in my opinion, this is the biggest limitation from the C um, is statelessness. And again, because it's stateless, it's very easy to reason about. It's a very nice and tiny bash script. Um, like it has many benefits, but for me as an end user, again, it feels a bit, well, yeah, clunky to use, a bit slow. But what this has taught me when I was looking through the source code was that um, in the end, it simply does nothing more than just doing some string processing, like to simply generate the system control command, the arguments, and then runs it for you. Or I mean, strictly speaking, also journal control. And I know this may seem very obvious for some more senior system administrators or more senior programmers, um, but at least in my programming world, just calling a sub-process and running a command line interface tool directly is always something that's considered like, I guess, bad, old school. Um, but this he did show me that there's actual value in simply running the command line interface that you're actually trying to provide a nice interface for. So it gave me this very nice inspiration to actually work on a stateful um, well, yeah, implementation evolution of the C, um, which I then called ISD. So what I'm using here is that I'm creating this, um, I'm utilizing system control as the command line interface, and I'm using a modern TUI library, terminal user interface library or framework, and then just do some basic Unix style string processing to actually make everything match up, and then I simply call the binary below. And yeah, the result is, well, what I'm going to show you now. So we start out again with this broken um, service that we're going to fix, um, but instead of the old way, we're going to use ISD. So here with ISD, just a quick like um, yeah, overview. In the top, we can see if we're in the system mode or user mode, just because I'm yeah, differentiating between them statically. We have the search bar. Um, well, yeah, but where you can do this fuzzy searching similar to the C. Below it, you have the different unit files um, on units listed. And you can also see like if it's online or offline, again, very similar to the C. And then we have also the system control status preview window below it. Um, but you can also see that we have like multiple tabs below it. And then you can switch between these tabs to like get very quick overview. Um, and then in the footer, you can see like the short shortcut um, key bindings to trigger actions depending on the widget you're currently viewing. So we're going to look for the service we're interested in. So here you see it's like very similar to the C up until now. Um, and just because I said like we have this differenti differentiation at the top between system and user, um, you can switch between them very easily. It doesn't like change much. It will try to search it, won't find a unit. And you can switch back to the system one and then, yeah, well, back at the beginning, so it's fairly easy. And you don't have to retype anything, for example. 
Um, yeah, and then, so now what we're going to do is like redo the example from the first version. So we're going to go to the preview window and then just look at the logs output. So this preview window has some basic, thanks, has some basic um, interaction. So here we can also scroll to the right, which wasn't possible, for example, in ZZ. Um, and again, here we can see that we don't really have um, the necessary information. So we're going to switch to the journal tab where we could also scroll up or we can just open it in the pager or in an editor. Because I mean, sometimes I prefer to open things in the editor just, yeah, because I feel more productive that way, I guess. So I open up in the pager and then again, very similar to the old example, I can then just use the pager uh, in a silly way and find the relevant log lines that I'm interested in. So I see the underlying issue and then I can close it. And now, this is like the main thing I wanted to work in the end, is that I'm right back where I started with everything. So now I can just continue on using this um, interface and just go on my merry way. Um, so here I'm going to con press Control O, so the runner system control action, which will open up this modal. And then you have the different like commands that you can execute. And the nice thing about these um, options is that you can configure them as a user. So if I have my preferred set, you can just add new subcommands that you find relevant and yeah, for your workflow, and it's going very easy to be integrated into this tool and this UI. And I mean, on the left-hand side, you have just the short codes, short cut keys that you can press. But what we're going to do then is going to run the um, edit runtime command, and now it opens up my user defined editor. So in this case, this is just Helix. Yeah. Um, I guess, well, yeah, a popular editor, I guess. Um, and now I can do my magic uh, key bindings with my editor of choice. And as we can see, maybe in this example, I'm not fast enough just typing it out, but I feel better using it. Um, I'm more happy using it. Um, and then I will close it. And then here you can see in this example, it has done this pseudo prefixing as it was required in this instance. Um, but the key, uh, I mean, the password has been cached, or the token, I guess, for pseudo. So I didn't have to enter my password. But if I would have had to enter it, then you would have seen this screen first, know what you are going to uh, validate or where you put your um, key, pass, uh, key phrase in. And then it would have opened the editor. And then, yeah, you'll see the result here. Exactly. So. Um, oops, a bit too fast, but you can see in the background that it's still offline. So now I know, okay, I still need to restart the action, by, I mean the service. So I'm going to do it again by open up the modal dialog, press S to do a quick restart. And then you can see that the service is online again. And now we could inspect the journal control output or the status output. Um, and then see that it's working. And now I'm just going to use curl to actually test that the service is up and running. And it is actually up and running. Okay, so CC, I mean, ISD has quite a few more features um, that I don't really have time to go into, but I just wanted to show like the normal workflow working with this tool, how it would look like. And one thing that I just want to wedge into the presentation if I have enough time is that even if you're never going to use ISD, um, I think that I found very useful, especially when you have many customization options, so if you have very complex configuration, um, is that you can actually um, try to integrate it better into your tooling. So here, for example, I just um, yeah, have created an option so you can open the configuration file directly from the tool. I mean, this is not that impressive, I guess. But you can see now that it has generated this template configuration file for the user. And the really interesting relevant part is the very first line where um, I am also providing a path to a JSON schema file. So I'm going to rely on the YAML language server, which is an LSP, a language server protocol program, um, that will then use the schema file to validate while the user is using the editor, the um, options they are entering. Because I know from experience, you can spend a lot of time writing the documentation, but uh, if everybody reads them, I mean, I know for myself that I wouldn't read them, <laughs> um, especially not if they're multiple pages long. So this provides a very nice experience. So here I'm just going to show you that um, you would type the option that you would like to configure in this configuration file. And just because I'm relying on this YAML language server, I can actually get all of the necessary information. I get the documentation. Here it's showing that there's an error because it's the wrong type. And then the user would see, ah, yeah, we configured it and made something different. And with the auto-completion support, 
It's also very helpful if you have these very complex, very long um, option strings that you need to um, yeah, customize. Exactly, and then this is just yeah, showing how it will end up working, but this is something that I think yeah, can be very useful, and because I guess yeah, creating JSON schema files is probably well supported in most languages, it is something that is fairly simple to implement by relying on like a different language server implementation, language server protocol, but it can help you definitely a lot with what you use as with the configuration file that you have created. Exactly. So I guess, but the main message that I wanted to share is not necessarily that you should use or ever have to use ISD, but that I think that we're having these well-tested, bullet-proven um, command line interface tools from Linux that are maybe a bit old, um, but for a reason, because they uh, yeah, support quite a long history. Um, but if we use them and just provide a very thin abstraction layer on top of them, and then work with modern tool frameworks, we can actually like modernize them or give them a modern feeling um, and yeah, make them look pretty. That's maybe uh, something that newer users would appreciate. Exactly, and then these are just the key takeaways, the summary from my presentation. Um, so I really do like the idea of simply using the upstream CLI tools because upstream will probably test them, so I can be fairly certain that system control will work with system D in general. Um, I do think that shelling out is still, well, a very effective method of achieving like an abstraction layer for the tool you're trying to abstract. Um, and with the limitation of the scope, I'm referring to, well, if instead of trying to recreate a pager or recreating an editor, just call the editor and the pager that the user likes, um, because they also like some very interesting pages or, I guess, tools to work with journal control output or logs in general. Um, and yeah, just the last point, if sometimes it makes sense to use a language server protocol to edit configuration files. Yep, and with that, I'm very much interested to hear your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Hey, good talk. Uh, do you know if there is an LSP for service files? If, excuse me, if there's a what? An LSP for service files? Uh, yeah, I think there's one that's written in Rust. OK. Um, yeah. I guess that's the answer. Somebody else was faster than I was. Uh, so you mentioned shelling out to CLI tools. Um, Leonard recently uh, talked about um, basically varlinkifying as many CLI tools as possible. So you can basically just uh, call out to varlink to the tools. Do you already make use of those kind of things? No, but I am aware of it. Um, but one thing I would like to share is that I was amazed at how well system control specifically work with old versions. Like I did, I just used the version, I wrote the code for the version that I had, and then it still worked with Ubuntu 10 or so was the latest one that I tried. Um, so yeah, but no, it's definitely going to look at Varlink, um, but yeah. Other questions? Maybe one from my side, has anybody used it, ISD? No, I first I hear about it, but I will definitely try it out. It's pretty. Any questions or comments? Oh, sorry, yes. I think you might have already answered, but is this written in Rust? No. Oh, oh okay. No, no, it's uh, actually written in Python, and I have a very long-winded answer. <laughs> but the short answer is I do think the Python packaging ecosystem has improved a lot within the last year with UV. Um, and the um, Tui framework textual was the by far the most well-documented and supported one. Um, but I mean, because the way it's written, it's very easy to port it to a different language if I wanted to down the road. Um, and I created an app image because I thought then I can solve the single binary issue. But then I've learned that Ubuntu hates app images, so I don't know. Like that's Linux, I guess. Any other questions? Going once, going twice. Okay. Well, yes, thank you. Thank you very Thanks. much.